had written, he interprets how they functioned. What I saw is primarily suicidal, uh, hooking up with Eric Harris. So you had anger and homicide, uh, homicidality on one side, and depression and suicidality and emotion on the other side coming together and led to a fatal friendship. Could Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris's crime have been prevented? Before the tragedy, there were several alarming portents that no one detected. These were, at first, seemingly harmless incidents. One day, Brooks Brown had an appointment with Eric Harris to go to school with him. He was late. His mother recounts what happened. Eric had thrown an ice chunk into the, the windshield and cracked the windshield. And I would say that's when things really took a turn for the worse. Um, we called the police over that. Um, the police came to the house. They went to the Harris's home. We did not file charges. Eric's father, Wayne Harris, asked his son to go and apologize. At the time, Mr. Harris kept a notebook about his son, simply titled Eric. The 23 pages of the notebook form part of a selection of recently published documents. Concerning the broken windscreen incident, his father wrote, Cracks in windshield, believing Eric versus wife. Overreaction to minor incident. Eric's dad and Eric never offered to pay for it, nor did he, uh, he, he explained it away, that it was a mistake, um, that he didn't mean to do it and that boys will be boys. Um, the dad was upset that we had called the police. A few weeks later, the whole neighborhood suspected Eric of having put glue into a number of car and house locks and setting fire to trees. Eric Harris denied it. But in his diary, he delighted in his deceit. I lie a lot, almost constant, and to everybody, just to keep my own ass out of the water. I know that I hate liars, and I am one myself. Oh, fucking well. Two and a half years before the killings, another more serious incident had occurred. The Columbine computer system was hacked into by Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris, and two others. They stole a list of codes giving access to students' lockers. Their objective was revenge against one particular student. And they put a, a threatening note in his locker saying, I think they might even kill him or something like that, to that effect. The school decided to suspend all four students for three days. In his notebook, Eric's father again took his son's part. He wrote, we feel victimized too. We don't want to be accused every time something happens. Eric is not at fault. Three months later, there was more trouble. Harris and Klebold were caught red-handed, stealing computer equipment from a vehicle. They were arrested by the police and sentenced to community service. They also had to write a letter of apology to the victim. Eric Harris wrote the letter. It was typed on his computer, and it was very polite. I am truly sorry for what I have done, and for any inconvenience I have caused you, your family, or your company. Respectfully, Eric Harris. But at the same time, he expressed rather different sentiments in his diary. One big fucking problem is people telling me what to fucking do, think, say, act, and everything else. FBI agent Dwayne Fusilier analyzes the two documents. From his journal, at the same time he wrote that apology letter, and he says, if I'm free, how come I can't deprive a person of his possessions if he leaves him sitting in the front seat of his van and that guy should be shot? I could see in this writing the, the anger and, and indignation. How dare 
authorities hold me responsible for breaking into that person's van. It's his fault. No guilt, no remorse, no internalization of, of these morals, that this is the wrong thing to do. When I saw particularly those two juxtaposed, written about the same incident, one publicly, one privately, that's when I started saying, this is a budding young psychopath here. Items that appeared on Eric Harris's internet site were even more serious. The entries were discovered by Brooks Brown a year before the massacre. In them, Harris claimed to have made homemade bombs. Atlanta, Folus, Altro and Patsy are complete. For those of you who don't know what they are, they are the first four true pipe bombs created entirely from scratch by the rebels, Reb and Vodka. Reb and Vodka were nom de guerre. The text ended with a sickeningly portentous threat. Now our only problem is to find the place that will be ground zero. On another page, Harris described his plans for the slaughter. I don't care if I live or die in the shootout. All I want to do is kill and injure as many of you pricks as I can. Especially a few people like Brooks Brown. Eric Harris had fallen out with Brooks Brown following the windscreen incident. Extremely anxious about these death threats, his mother, Judy Brown, visited the sheriff's office to discuss them. The writing was much more violent than it had, had ever been. Before it was uh, jokes and uh, vandalizing homes and getting back at people, but now it was way over the top. One detective said that he thought he had heard of Eric Harris, that Eric Harris had been in trouble. He went into the other room, he pulled something off the computer and said that there was an Eric Harris that had in fact been arrested for breaking into a van. So at that point he said, I've got the kid. And I said, do you need more information? And he said, I don't need it, I've got the kid. He seemed like he, he was on top of things when we were talking to him. The very next day, Judy Brown ran into Harris in the shopping arcade. I was in the grocery store, and I saw Eric run in, and he slapped a magazine down on the counter, and it was shotgun magazine, and it scared me because I didn't know he was into guns. Now he's into guns. I was scared to death that he was going to shoot my son, and I wanted to make sure that Detective Hicks was doing his job and I wanted to make sure that Eric didn't know that we had turned him in because I didn't want to do anything to upset Eric. Eric was an injustice collector. He never let anything go. So I called Detective Hicks and I left a message, please call me, this kid is into guns. I tried to call him back several times and he would never return my call. It is now six months before the shootings. Eric writes in his diary, Guns. I need guns. Get me some fucking firearms. The two apprentice killers' problem was that they were still minors. It was therefore illegal for them to buy firearms. To get around the law, they asked an adult girlfriend to help them. Five months before the massacre, they got hold of two sawn-off shotguns, a 9mm rifle and some ammunition. I am fucking armed. I feel more confident, stronger more godlike. I have confidence in my ability to deceive people. Hopefully, I'll make it to April. We have guns. We fucking have them, you sons of bitches. Ha! It's all over now. The point of no return. March 1999, and one month to go. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris go to the forest with friends for firing practice. Yeah, take a look at that. That was my ghetto gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fucking slug. Now imagine that in someone's fucking brain. It hurt my wrist like a son of a bitch. I bet so. Guns are bad. When yeah. you saw them off and make them illegal, bad things happen to you. <laughs> Just to say no to sawed-offs. <laughs> <Bad. laughs> no, no, no. 
Harris and Klebold prepare their plan of attack. They draw the school and the refectory, sketching out where they will...